So can I get it started? Yes, you can. Perfect, okay. So thank you, uh, thank you everyone. And I look forward to talking to you, uh, hearing from you, getting to know your thoughts on a specific condition, a specific disease that I am really interested in and my research is heavily invested in that disease. And you could see uh, there are some terms on this page, assess, diagnose, treat, sarcopenia. So these are some technical terms. We will go through what do these terms mean? And then I will share some of the ideas on how people have targeted sarcopenia and what's could, what could be the next. I will try to keep my talk to 30, 35 minutes at the most 35, 40 minutes. Um, and the last 15, 10, 15 minutes, I want to hear from you if you have any questions. And feel free to ask any question related to muscle, uh, bone, um, how muscle, bone, fat, nerves interact, anything that comes to your mind, feel free to ask me. I may not know the answer to all of those questions, but whatever I know, I will share. So feel free to ask any type of questions, any questions related to bone, muscle, nerves, brain, because all of these are interconnected. So I will touch a bit on my journey so far, and then I will go through the meaning of some terms, and then I will put an argument. Why should we worry about sarcopenia and how to address sarcopenia? So I'm originally from India that you see in green, highlighted in green, and all my training for masters, my PhD, uh, my fellowship has been in the US. Okay. So what you see in red is where I originally come from within India. And my, for my training as a PT, I moved to central India, which is highlighted in green. There is this famous uh, college, uh, Mahatma Gandhi Medical College, from where I got my physical therapy. And after I got my PT uh, from India, I practiced as a physical therapist for a year, but I was always interested in research. And that's when I did, that's my mentor from India. So that's when I decided to move to the US. So what you see in, in uh, brown color here is Oklahoma. So Oklahoma gave me my master's training and I was fortunate that I worked in a really prestigious lab and I got to know how to work with older adults who have weak bones. And there is a specific name for that, osteoporosis. Osteo meaning bone, porosis meaning it's like pores. So when you look on X-ray, like a really high resolution X-ray, those bones look like they have developed pores in it. And that's why the name osteoporosis. But are bones the only thing that get affected uh, by itself? Or is there something else which gets affected first and then affects bone? And this is where my, my, my mind started to research. Why bone became like that? I started to ask. And then I found the answer. Huh, bone is strong because of strong muscles. Because the muscles, when they act on bone, they push, they pull, they create lots of forces. And to adapt to those forces, bones grow. They become stronger. So I wondered, before bones develop these pores, do muscles become weak? And can we capture those people who may develop pores in bone before if we start to look at their muscles? And that's when I decided to move to Delaware, which you see here. Uh, it's near the Atlantic, uh, yeah, it's, it's at the coast. So at Delaware, I started to investigate the interaction of muscle and bone, and I specifically worked with children with cerebral palsy. These children with cerebral palsy were walkers, so they could walk on their toes. 
their muscles were so tight that the heel would not rest on floor. So what the MD would say, you know what, Harsh? Uh, if we can put their heels on floor, maybe they can walk better. And maybe you can do better PT, physical therapy. Let's try for that. So there is, there is a medicine by the name Botox. Botox paralyzes the muscle. So when these muscles, which are really tight and pulling the heels up, were injected with Botox, heel came down because muscles were paralyzed. They were not acting anymore. The idea was before the effect of drugs go away, you really make this muscle strong, that will make the bone strong. So we invested, we found some interesting results. But the more I studied muscle, I got interested in balance. Because what started to happen, I would go to uh, these, uh, the homes of uh, the children who were in our study, and they started to say, you know what, Harsh? My child started to walk without crutches, or my child uh, took steps without the help of any railing. Huh. So is their balance getting better? Because muscle is getting better? So I started to uh, wonder, people with low muscle strength, is that the reason they fall and they cannot recover? And is balance also uh, another advantage of having good muscles? So I said, you know what? I need to train more in balance. And then I went to Baltimore, the School of Medicine. So at the School of Medicine, I did my fellowship. And that's where I started to investigate bone, muscle, and balance, which is dictated by your how they are interrelated. After my fellowship, I came to Alabama and I joined University of Alabama at Birmingham, Department of Physical Therapy as an assistant professor. And since last three and a half, four years, I have been doing research, trying to really tease out what muscle, what type of muscle and which joint is affected most, which can affect your bone strength, which can affect your balance. Because remember, to find the problem and the exact where the problem is, is the hardest job. Because once you find out the problem, treatment is kind of standard. Treatment will work. But to find the exact problem will make that treatment most efficient. And that's where my current research is focused into. Finding exactly which muscle, uh, what type of muscle, which joint needs to be uh, addressed to recover balance, to work on bone in older adults who have osteoporosis, in older adults who are at a greater risk for fall, in children with obesity, in children with cerebral palsy. So these are the populations that I work with. These are my three mentors, Dr. Deb from Oklahoma, Dr. Modleski from Delaware, and Dr. Rogers, Mark Rogers from Baltimore. So I am currently at UAB, um, and these are some links. Um, according to the latest ranking, we are the 13th best physical therapy school in the country. We are also one of the most uh, highly funded federal, uh, federally funded public schools. I think we are number six or number five, and there's a lot of research which is going on. I can mail this PowerPoint to you if you want, uh, so feel free to let me know or Ms. Atkins know so that I can mail this to you. So why I'm telling this to you, if you want to do some cool research, you are welcome to explore our website and contact me. So moving on to the term assessment. What is assessment? Assessment is an evaluation made by a healthcare provider on whether or not to provide service. So why is assessment important? Assessment is very important because based on assessment, you diagnose something. And it's very similar to, uh, for example, when I teach students here, time to time, I assess my students 
how they are understanding the coursework. And my students assess me how well I am delivering the course material to them. Once we do the assessment, we find where the gaps are, where the strengths are, and that leads to a diagnosis. So the gaps, the weakness, that become the diagnosis. The strengths become those points which you can foster easily. So that's how, that's why assessment is a very important tool in the uh, hands of a healthcare provider. But again, it is not just limited to healthcare sector. Assessment is going on everywhere. Yeah, a good assessor can be a good diagnostic. Uh, can diagnose well, and if you diagnose well, you treat well. So treatment is based on diagnosis, and diagnosis is based on assessment. So the detailed assessment, the better the diagnosis. But again, there is a chance when you get lots of detailing knowledge, signal comes with noise. More the signal, more the noise. So how you take out the noise so that you are just working with signal. So what does this mean? When you do assessment, there could be lots of factors which you can be assessing and your mind, our minds can make connections. Some far-fetched connections, some easy connections. So that's when you need to figure out what are the most important measures that I'm looking at for an effective diagnosis. Otherwise, diagnosis could be very close, but not exactly the diagnosis it should have been. So whenever we get more information, more noise also comes with that information. So one of the things that I advise my students here, you need to so we give you the information, now it's on you to filter out the noise and have the signal come to you. Hope it makes sense, yeah. Hope there is not much noise in this. <laughs> oh no, I, I usually have a dog in the background, so it's fine. <laughs> oh no, no, you're fine, you're fine. Sure, sure. So what is diagnosis? Yes, so better the signal to noise ratio, so greater the signal, greater the good information, the concrete information, diagnosis is uh, easier. Typically diagnosing anything is the hardest part. It could be in medicine, it could be personal life, it could be in education. Diagnosing a root cause is the hardest part. So assessment and diagnosis is the time when you really need to go into the rabbit hole and then pull out everything and then make sure you're doing a good job at that. So thus we see that assessment and diagnosis are different. Treatment is the medical attention given to sick person or animal. So treatment for most of the part is pretty standard. It's just that the right treatment should be provided and right treatment is based on the correct diagnosis. So again, we are back to where we started. Assessment and diagnosis is the most, are the most important parts. Just my opinion. And that's where my research is also focused on. I really want to make sure that if I want to make each minute that a patient comes to or goes to a clinic meaningful, very effective, the assessment and diagnosis are more than 100%. So each minute is utilized towards addressing the root cause. So that brings me to the uh, disease of my interest, sarcopenia. Wherever you see the word penia, understand that it means weakness. And wherever you see the word sarco, that means muscle. So sarcopenia, weakness, muscle. Osteopenia, osteo is bone. Penia is weakness, weakness of bone. Uh, what could be something else? Uh, uh, you can just add penia in um, knowledge penia, loss of knowledge. No, just a made up term. Yeah. So osteopenia, sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is started with the idea that muscle mass is lost in various diseases. 
But that was not considered a condition until like late 90s. And then there was a scientist, Dr. Rosenberg, who came up with this term. We need to address loss of muscle mass because muscles, they take glucose from your blood. So in a patient with diabetes, if there is very low muscle mass, there will be more glucose in blood because now low muscle, the low muscle mass, they cannot take glucose from blood. Muscle produces lots of hormones. So if you have low muscle mass, the hormones which are responsible for growth, which are responsible for building bone, they go down. So bones go down. Muscle helps in heat regulation. Muscles store water. So once you start to lose muscle, lots of other conditions can start to happen. So this should be a condition by itself. And then for next 10, 15 years, there was a lot of debate. Uh, what is sarcopenia? What is not sarcopenia? And lately, finally, actually, CDC has recognized sarcopenia as a medical condition. There is a European working group, which is what you see here, EWGSOP, which is European working group on sarcopenia. It has three markers. If someone has low muscle mass, someone has a low muscle strength or physical performance, then someone is diagnosed as sarcopenia. RSMI, this is another measure. There is a machine by the name DEXA. It is an X-ray machine. So what this X-ray machine does, the patient lies on the bed. There are two X-rays coming from the uh, light source. And both those X-rays are working at the same time and they take image of your body. Once the results are printed out, that result gives you how much muscle you have in both of your upper extremities and lower extremities. So if you add the muscle mass of your upper extremities and lower extremities, and you divide it by how tall you are, height by your height squared, you get a specific number. And then there are set numbers. If you're below this number and a female, you're sarcopenic. If you're below this number and you're a male, you're sarcopenic. This is an example of how sarcopenia looks like uh, when you look uh, a microscopic view. So what you see on the uh, left panel is the lean body mass versus fat in the thigh muscles, thigh compartment of a young versus old woman. So the top panel is the old woman. The bottom panel is the young woman. What you see here is that the why is that the yellow, um, the really shiny part is fat, and the opaque, the dark part is muscle. And you can see that as we grow old, fat not only surrounds the muscle, but it but it also goes in the muscle. And muscle, what are muscle? Muscle are el elastic tissues. So imagine. If an elastic tissue is infiltrated with fat, which is inelastic, what will happen to the elasticity? It will go down. So the force by muscle, which is dependent on the elasticity, goes down. So the force goes down, the elasticity goes down. And you know the um, you may know this uh, phrase, use or lose. So the lower you start to use, the more you lose. So an environment, a body environment gets created where doing everyday task becomes like quite demanding. And then you say, you know what? I just want to sit. And this is such a hard thing for me to do. So it becomes a vicious cycle. And that's where sarcopenia becomes an urgent need, an urgent condition to address. What you see here again is young versus old. And 
So what you see here are the two types of muscle fibers. And what you see in old is, what you see in old is that there is a predominance of one type of muscle fiber, which is known as type one versus type two. Type one are slow fibers and type two are fast fibers. So not only muscle mass is reduced, but the first type of muscle fibers to be lost are type two, which are responsible for fast action. So if you want to grab something real fast, you want to sprint, uh, you want to push something real fast, those are the fibers, type two, that you want to recruit. With aging, you reduce overall muscle, but a greater percentage of type two is lost. So you become slow. So that is another disadvantage. So how do we train that? Can we preserve these type two muscle fibers in, with our aging? So these are some of the questions that we are investigating and addressing. So these are some cutoff points. So based on assessment, if someone um, has a grip strength, and then you see you have cutoff points for men, cutoff points for women. There are some tests, chair stand test, gait speed, tying the pen go, which is TUG. Um, so there are specific criteria that for men and women, if they perform less than a specific threshold, they get diagnosed as sarcopenia. Now, this is an important concept. I'm sorry, my voice is not actually working super good today. So to know what is a disease, you need to know what is healthy. <coughs> so on the x-axis, you have age, and on the y-axis, you have grip strength. So there is a machine uh, that's called handheld dynamometer. You uh, hold that machine, and the tester asks you to make a really strong grip. When you make a strong grip and hold for five seconds, it gives you a number, and that is your grip strength. On the y-axis, that's what the grip strength is. So based on a large number of population, we know what is the healthy value of grip strength for males and females. And then this type of data helps us to know what is a disease condition. So this is just, I want to show you that how these numbers, the cutoff points for grip strength were reached so first, healthy people were assessed, and then based on that, the cut of points were decided. <clears throat> there are lots of causes of sarcopenia, and we will not go into uh, details. This is from actually this picture is from one of the papers that um, we publish. And if you go into the cellular and the molecular level, stress, inflammation, loss of nerves, all of these things can lead to loss of fibers and muscle mass, which together can lead to sarcopenia. So why, why we should worry about sarcopenia? Well, world is getting older. And by that I mean, every hour in the US, someone is turning 60. So the proportion of people who are turning 60 and above <coughs> is really uh, on high. So sarcopenia, the percentage of population which might be affected with sarcopenia is going to be really high in coming years. 
And that's what makes it an urgent condition to treat. So if, if you can see, 35.5, so more than one in every three adults, older adults, has sarcopenia. That's a lot. Yeah. Versus if you look at the total population, the number may not be that bad, only 17.7%. But if you go in the elderly, it's very close to 40%. So that's where uh, this condition demands an urgent attention. And then we talked about how muscle has different roles. So it can have multiple adverse effects. And you can see if you have sarcopenia, your strength, your power, your endurance goes down, balance goes down, bone density goes down, your fatigue, risk for fatigue goes up, physical activity goes down. And all of this further can lead to increase in body weight, which further makes it a vicious cycle. So it can have multiple adverse effects. <laughs> now, nutrition holds a very important role in sarcopenia, mainly because protein is an important constituent of maintaining muscle mass. So there have been a lot of studies which have shown that if you have sufficient amount of protein in your diet, that can at the least help maintain your muscle mass. As we grow older, nutrition also takes a beating. <laughs> People start to lose taste. They, are, they do not feed well. There are lots of conditions which can lead to just not liking the food. They are on multiple drugs. Those drugs have side effects, adverse effects. They interact with each other. And that's where nutrition becomes a centerpiece in the management of sarcopenia. So maximize, go maximize gains to minimize loss. So while our body is in the natural state of anabolism, meaning uh, it's in the natural state of building up. You want to take really all the steps that you can to improve the muscle mass. So that bigger the amount in the bank is, lower the rate of loss would be when the loss starts to happen. So this is what it tells you, that in the early life, up to age 25, less than 30, you really want to maximize your gains in muscle mass so that in older life, the loss is minimized uh, if you have already good muscle mass and good muscle strength. And there are a lot of, lots of complications if you lose muscle mass, yeah. So there are multiple factors here, aging, disease, sedentary behavior, inactivity, and malnutrition. Four main factors, which can interact with each other. They can coexist with each other. One can lead to the other, and it becomes like a chicken and egg situation. And they all can work together to uh, bring the condition of sarcopenia and foster that condition. So this is affects how aging and illness, they can interact with each other to reduce muscle mass. Aging and any disease can uh, lead to malnutrition and aging and disease by itself. They can reduce physical activity, which can reduce protein uh, synthesis, which can reduce muscle mass, which can uh, reduce muscle capacity to generate force which further can lead to sarcopenia. And since with aging, naturally, there are lots of conditions that can happen. The chances of sarcopenia or someone getting sarcopenia uh, becomes a higher. Now, if you look at these factors, aging, disease, inactivity, malnutrition, are these unique for sarcopenia? 
Well, if you look for some of the uh, major conditions affecting the population, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, obesity, you will find that these factors are common. And that's where I think uh, what actually my research is investigating is that can we come up with a treatment that can target osteoporosis, sarcopenia, and obesity at the same time? so that the treatment becomes more effective. If the causative factors are same, why cannot the treatment be same? So this is where my research is leading to. Um, from this slide, what I want to get you is bone, muscle, and fat. They are like three companions and they're always talking to each other. And if someone gets affected, the other two also get affected. So they all talk to each other. One gets affected, the other gets affected. And that's why the conditions uh, sometimes coexist with each other. Just give me a moment, I need some water. Okay. So how do we treat sarcopenia? Yeah, uh, I, I believe there is an algorithm for everything. Sometimes we have figured out that algorithm, and sometimes we don't know that algorithm. Yeah. When I shared this with my wife, she asked me, so is there, a, is there, a, is there an algorithm for marriage? I said, yes, my mom, she put the deadline and then I had to marry. <laughs> no, it's just kidding. But yes, so there is an algorithm for everything. And it's just that we need to figure out the factors. And once we figure out the factors, we need to figure out what is the weightage that we give to each of these factors. And that helps us to know 60% of that 20% of you, and maybe 5% of you, if I mix this well together, I think I will have the best uh, results. Now, the question is, how do you decide the weightage? How do you know which one is more important? Which one is less important? And that's where you really want to assess well. You really want to collect lots of signal so that when you are diagnosing, 60%, 20%, 10%, you have a greater, I would say, uh, greater probability of being correct. We cannot say that it will be correct, but there may be a greater probability. And then mistakes will happen. And then that mistakes will teach you again. And then you will say, you know what? I thought that was only 20%, but ah, maybe not. <laughs> that really affected my experiment. So I need to rethink. So you recalibrate and there comes a new algorithm. So this is how research also works. And then eventually you come up with the aha moment. This is the treatment of sarcopenia. Okay. So for now, uh, the algorithm uh, has a acronym, FACTS, find, assess, confirm, and decide the severity. Without going into detail, these are based on some of the same tests or the imaging modalities that we talked about. You use X-ray, DEXA, you use a muscle strength test, how fast someone can walk. So, and all of these together, <clears throat> all of these together helps to decide sarcopenia, the severity of sarcopenia. So what is the PT treatment? Well, PT treatment wants to build the muscles and muscles will uh, grow to signal. And what signals do they need? Load. So if you resist the muscle contraction, muscle has to become stronger 
to overcome that resistance. And this is the concept that as PTs, we use to uh, build muscle. So that's not very new. It has been uh, utilized. So what our lab is doing over here, we are trying to prove that whenever you say that, um, or whenever you hear that I'm doing some muscle building exercise, it would be something like, say, if I have an object in my hand and I want a muscle building exercise, I have to lift it against the gravity. That's the typical conventional idea. What we are saying that, you know what? Let's reverse this movement. Meaning, I want to see how uh, much load you can bear while the load will overpower you and it will lower you down. So it's not contraction against gravity. It is fighting against gravity, but the gravity is going to. So to give us an idea, when you, uh, when you get up from toilet seat, okay? So when you get up from toilet seat or when you get up from a chair, you are pushing yourself up against gravity, but when you are lowering yourself onto chair, and if you don't control that force, you will fall. You will just collapse onto the chair, but you don't collapse. You make a very controlled fall. You control your body weight, and then you make sure that you don't collapse onto the chair and you don't hurt yourself. So we want to see, what is the maximum weight, for example, that I can put on your shoulders and you can do the same activity without collapsing onto the chair. So muscles here are acting differently. In the first example, when you are getting up from chair, they were pushing against gravity. But here, they are again, they are again pushing against gravity, but going, but going to know that gravity has to win. Is that making sense? Okay. It's a little bit counterintuitive. So I will uh, maybe let's, I will take one more minute and explain the specific exercise that we do in our lab. So if you have been to the gym, you have you may have seen leg press machine. You sit on a chair, um, a seat, and you place your legs on two plates, on the one plate, it is connected to a stack of weight. And based on how much weight you want to lift, you push it. And that's where you feel the resistance. And then you relax while it comes back at you. In our lab, we have a machine where you're supposed to relax when the plates go away. But when the plates come toward you, we want you to resist with whatever you have. You will re be resisting those plates which are coming toward you. The plates will come irrespective because the motor senses how much force you are producing and it always makes sure that it wins over you. So it will come at a specific distance that we want to while you are still resisting the incoming of those plates. So in technical language, it's called East centric exercise. So why we are, why my lab is putting uh, money on that? There is some research which suggests that as we grow older, the ability to lift is hampered, but the ability to lower a load, in fact, is preserved. It's something which I believe nature has built so that as we grow old, we can save ourselves from falling when we are going down a ramp or something evolutionary could be, there could be evolutionary something. So we are thinking that we got to utilize this specific phase of muscle to build muscle growth or bone for balance. So more on that later. Uh, but these are the key points. There is an algorithm for everything. Assessment, diagnosis are critical. 
you got to have a great signal. So make sure you filter out the noise. And uh, if you're interested in working with sarcopenia and osteoporosis, feel free to contact me. So I'm, I'm open for any questions. Oh, this is my son, Kavi. Uh, Kavi is 18 months old. And yeah, he has been lifting a lot lately. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. I got a question. I got a whole list, so I got to read, okay? Can um, sarcopenia turn into any other type of disease? Can sarcopenia itself turn into other type of disease? Yeah, my, something, something. My answer would be no. Mm -hmm. Sarcopenia itself can lead to other types of disease. Yeah. So does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. The severity of sarcopenia can change. It can go from mild to moderate to severe. But the disease itself will be uh, the CDC term, sarcopenia. Okay. I, I yeah. see there's a, a chat question. Okay. So what are the symptoms you should look for? Hmm. This is a great question. So what are some of the symptoms that you should look for when someone, uh, uh, you, you think someone may have, uh, sarcopenia. Some of the daily activities which the individual used to do are becoming very taxing. And that is uh, leading us, someone to question, you know what, five years back, you used to walk uh, 1.8 miles or three miles without huffing and puffing. And now look at you. I mean, you go and you walk and you come back, you are tired. You have started to walk slowly. You have started to, so sometimes when we pick grocery, uh, two years ago, you were able to pick up these grocery bags and now you're not able to. So these are some of the daily signs and symptoms that can uh, start to give an idea of, hey, I wonder if you're um, losing your muscle mass, if you're losing your muscle quality, and then you can start talking about sarcopenia. Is there pain associated with it? As far as I know, pain typically is not associated with sarcopenia, but what is associated with sarcopenia mainly is fatigue, um, lack of uh, endurance. So you start to lose your capacity. You uh, become more inactive. And that those are some of the telltale uh, signs of sarcopenia. Pain typically is not. Now, why? Because sarcopenia by itself is a condition of muscle, not nerves. Nerves are not involved here. And that's why pain is not that of a vital uh, sign here. What, do, uh, what, is, what symptoms is, does uh, most of your patients have that come? Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Um, the symptoms that most of the patients have when they come see you, what are, yes. what, what are the most prevalent ones? So some of the most prevalent symptoms would be, we ask, um, have you had fallen in the past year or so? Uh, well, no, not really. Then we ask, have you had any slip or trip where you almost fell, but able to catch yourself? Yes, yes, yes. How many times do you think it happened? Uh, five times, six times. So that starts a yellow flag. Then we start to ask about physical activity. And that gives a yellow flag. Then we start to test muscle strength. And that's where things start to make sense. And finally, when you get an X-ray and you see those muscle mass really low, 
we say uh, you may have sarcopenia actually. So why don't we start thinking about it? Yeah, but typically these are uh, the signs uh, are lack of physical activity. So someone was very physically active, but now is getting tired easily, less physically active. Uh, yeah. What about um, when you have the grip test and the stand test? Um, can you uh, decipher if they have sarcopenia with maybe just one, or do they have to show issues in all all of the tests? Uh, so typically, they have to show two of three. So walking speed. Timed up and go, sit to stand, uh, grip strength, muscle mass. So, uh, so if we see any deficit in strength, it could be grip strength, uh, or it could be some other type of strength. If it, if we see there is any deficit in functional uh, tasks, such as um, how fast or how slow you're walking, and the nail, on, the final thing would be muscle mass. Uh, then it's a sure shot of sarcopenia. Now, we talked about the severity of sarcopenia. So maybe a patient at this time point is not showing uh, a deficit in one of the domains. So a visit would be, a follow-up visit would be arranged like in three months or six months. And then it will again be done. So that's how things progress. My um, daughter had a question. <laughs> she, she asked if it was something that um, could prevent it, but you mentioned as you're younger, um, you could do things like they do, sports and, and work out and stuff like that. Yeah. But when you, when you miss the boat at a certain age, <laughs> what do you do? And that's a good question. So when you miss the boat, what do you do? Uh, well, first of all, you have not missed the boat per se. You have missed the best boat. The boat is still there, but the best boat may not be still there. Yeah. So the best part about muscle is that it's trainable. Our body, it's adaptable. It will adapt to whatever load you place on it. As long as the load is safe and at the same time, challenging. <clears throat> so at any time point, if you start doing some of the strength building exercise, that would again start getting those signals and muscle will again start for like anabolic, anabolic processes. So yes, it, you can start uh, and at any time point. Yeah. Now, as far as, um male and female, who uh, has the higher chance of uh, getting sar sar sarcopenia? Because I would imagine that women probably are more prevalent yes. to uh, getting it because of the, uh, you know, men tend to be more strong and yeah. stuff you're, like that. You're right. You're correct. You're correct, Ms. Andrian. Yeah. Females, females are more predisposed uh, for sarcopenia. So I have a question. Um, so, what is a normal day like you for uh, well for you at your work? I'm sorry, Sophia. I coughed and I think I could not hear you. Okay. So, what is your normal day like for you at your work? Okay. So, pre-pandemic or pandemic? Uh, both. <laughs> both. Okay. So, pre-pandemic and pandemic. Ah, uh, I think now. Um, uh, we are back to kind of kind of pre-pandemic stage uh, with the university. Uh, the best part here at the UAB is that most of the people have been vaccinated. UAB has done some real, real good work. Uh, so we are kind of back to pre-pandemic stage. So what we do here, I have uh, a nice group here. And by nice group, I mean, I have two PhD students, one master's student and undergraduate students. And 
DPT, Doctor of Physical Therapy students. So I teach uh, on two specific days, Tuesday and Thursdays, uh, to DPT students. One of the same days, Tuesday, I teach the PhD class. So Tuesdays and Thursdays are all about teaching. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I mainly dedicate towards research. So that's where my main um, uh, effort goes toward. And then sometimes I, I mentioned that we work with children with obesity. So when you work with children, you got to work on weekends sometimes. So sometimes we work on weekends, but then we make it up. Uh, so when I work with my students here and if they come on weekends and they work because it's an extensive data collection day, they, they take off on Monday or Tuesday. So it's, it's very flexible, but at the same, um, same time, the best thing that I would say is that uh, it's enjoyable. And I will tell you what is enjoyable, the creation of new knowledge and sometimes knowing that you are the only one who knows this. <laughs> You're the only, and then, you know, so I was talking to my PSD student and I said, aha, we got a story to tell now. We got to share this story. So one of the, I would say, the ethical part that lies with us is that when we create data, we can look at those numbers from multiple sites. Uh, you know what, as you learn statistics, you will see there is so much uh, various ways in which the same number can be looked at a different, from different time points, uh, from different angles. So what we decide is that you have got to tell the complete story. So the good, the bad, and the ugly, everything you've got to tell. Because you cannot just tell the good story. Because people outside the lab, they are going to rely on this story to make up their stories or to create new stories. So this is the best part, how we message, how we write the message such that the good message does not get lost, but at the same time, good message comes with its limitations. This all is good, but remember, we did not do this. Remember, we studied only these people. Remember, we, uh, when we collected data, three people, they couldn't do this test because maybe it was too hard. So all of this makes fun, creating the story. Uh, so I think this is what makes it really enjoyable. Didn't that answer your question, Sophia? All right. So, uh, yes. What is your favorite thing to do as a scientist? Like at your oh, work? Yeah. yeah, you know what, as a scientist? Like your favorite. Uh, oh yeah, my favorite thing, you know what, Sophia? Uh, so, for example, grip strength test, okay? How do you assess grip strength test? There is a machine, it's a bulky machine, and you, it has a spring, you really push that spring with as much as you can, you hold it for five seconds, and then you see. What I want to do, and uh, this is what I always try to push myself, I want to come up with fun experiments. So how can I make this study real fun? Where not only me, but the participants, the patients also have a lot of fun. And someone, when reads my story, uh, that person, uh, I want that person to say, oh, that guy was having fun while doing this science. So this is what my most uh, favorite part, to come up with some fun experiments. Uh, so right now, actually, we are doing a really fun experiment where our participants, uh, well, the name of the test is, how low can you go and how high can you fly? So these are some real good things. Uh, I mean, fun things that we, uh, that, yeah, that I like. Yeah. So for those that would like to um, possibly work in that field, can you describe the education and the career options available? Yeah. So work in that field, meaning what, Ms. Adrian? 
in the field that you're in. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because there, most of the kids on the phone uh, right now are in middle and high school. Okay. So uh, I will tell you one um, uh, one of the paths that I believe uh, I recently got to know, and some students have utilized that path to uh, mark their career. So. UAB has a program called SHIPIP, and I can actually send you the details of that program. So from all over the country, students are selected. They are given a scholarship. They are given a stipend. These students are either freshmen, sophomore, junior, senior. It's a good mix. And they come here and they spend six to eight weeks at UAB working with different labs. Our department is also one of the like one of the departments at UAB. Uh, so UAB is primarily a medical college. So most of the students who come here, they get exposed to dentistry, PT, medicine, surgery, all those types of uh, medicine-related uh, sector. And once they uh, get to know the people here. Some of those students maintain contact. And in fact, I will tell you, uh, some of those students were early accept, got early acceptance into our program. So they did not have to uh, take GRE actually. And based on their GPA, their experience, uh, they were offered a seat. Yeah. So I can send you the details of that program. So once a student uh, decides to go into college, uh, they can look to apply for that program. But otherwise, it's a typical, uh, you do your uh, undergrad, and then you want to go to a lab uh, where you want to do your master's, working in that specific field you are really are interested in. So when I graduated, I, I knew that I really wanted to work with bone and muscle. I was not sure if I would be working with children or older adults, but I knew it was bone and muscle that always excited me. So I joined a lab where bone and muscle was the bread and butter of that lab. And I made sure that that, that specific lab had the latest state of the art equipment. So once I got that, uh, once you are in, in, into the field, then you know who's who, and then you make connections and you know, where do you want to uh, go? It's, it's the first step, getting into the field. That's, I, I believe, is the most critical. Once you are into the room, you know who are in, who, who, who is sitting in the room. Got it. That's great. That's great to know. Um, and, and if you don't mind sending that information, if it's not already on your PowerPoint. Um, I, will, I, will, I will send that to you. Greatly appreciate it. Right. Um, anybody else have any more questions for Harsh? Um, you mentioned you went to medical school. Are there any traits you recommend someone should have when considering uh, going to medical school? Yeah, I think it's persistence. It's about persistence. Yeah, that's that's the only trait that I can think of. And be it a medical school or an engineering school or a grad school, any school. You got to be persistent. Yeah, yeah. And it's 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 a but it, it got to be yeah it's, it's worth it once once the uh once the payoff is is what you're looking for at the end it's hard but yeah. through the determination and i know most of you have that already um yeah. just be persistent like he says and yeah. um you'll be you'll be glad that you did yes, the, yes. Day. and and you know what isabel when you look around yourself uh, social media and uh whatever media, uh, this is an age of instant gratification. Persistence relies on delayed gratification, and that's hard. So instant gratification versus delayed gratification is just hard. So, but if you're persistent and you know that I'm, I'm in the race for delayed gratification, I think you will be fine. Again, this is just my two cents. Yeah. No, that's an excellent example because we 
we live in a society now where it's like me, 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 right now, right now, right? So, yes. so that that was a good analogy uh, for for something because you know in the times where we came from, a lot of this stuff did not exist. So we had to wait no matter what, right? We had to read yes. a book instead of, yes. you know, you can uh, do everything online now and um, it, it's so much easier, but but sometimes it's too rushed. So yes. just take your time and yeah. um, it'll be great. Yes. But I, we hope that you, we always have um, our presenters on rotation so we would love for you to come back because I am fairly certain that a lot of us are going to have questions offline for you, if you don't mind. And, sure, sure, sure. and we hope you can come back. Usually oh. um, we're, we're, I think we start up again in August. So we yes. could, we'll, I'll contact you again and put you on rotation again um, right after that in the summer sometimes, probably heading into fall. But we really appreciate you taking your time. Say hello to your sweet little baby in the back. And um, if you have any relatives or anything in India that's going through this COVID crisis, yes, send yes. them our well wishes, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adrian. Thank you so much. Very appreciated. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. You guys have a great weekend, and thank you for joining again. And we'll see you yes. next Friday, okay? All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.